Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. You know, when you go through the affairs of life and you have loads of questions, there's only one place to be. That's the house of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we give thanks and praise to your name. Once again, we are here before you. Jehovah, your word, you said, it comes from heaven. It's like the rain. It drops down and it does not come back to you void without watering the ground and causing it to bring seed so it can be able to give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. We look to you this afternoon to speak to our hearts, Jehovah Lord. May your word encourage us where we need encouragement. May it heal us where we need healing. May it rebuke us if we need your rebuke this afternoon. Help us. Break it down in such a way that we will understand. Speak to us where we are. In Jesus' name. I want to talk about a topic that I believe is very relevant to the times that we are in at this point. I want to talk about the race. I think if there is one word that's been used more often than any in these last few weeks, it's about the race. I want us to start by looking at the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'll read from verse 24 to 27. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do, we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running endlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The last two weeks has revealed a serious fault line in the body of Christ. And we must not continue to allow that fault line to deepen. The body of Christ, the Bible tells us, is the church, is one body, and it is not divided. It is not separated into various ethnic groups or political parties or countries of origin. It is one body, and it is the church of Jesus Christ. If there is anything in the last two weeks that the last two weeks teaches us as believers, I think it is about the fact that the word of God is forever true. Psalms 119 verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. The scripture we read this afternoon tells us that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. It says you should run in such a way as to get the prize. In the election of August 8, we see it as a type of a race. And in fact, it was almost like more than a marathon of a race. 
with more than 1,882 prizes to be won. These 1,882 are the individual seats that people were contesting for. And we were told that there were about 16,259 contestants for these 1882 prizes. And this does not include those who lost at the primaries and decided not to continue. Since the results were announced, our attention has been drawn particularly to the big ticket item, the presidential race. But apart from the presidential race, there were other 1,881 races that took place. You see, the joy of winning in any one of these 1,881 other races other than the presidency, or the pain of losing, is no less significant than that of the presidency. At the end of the elections, we had 1882 winners, according to IEBC. And if we take that 1882, from the total contestants, it meant there were 14,377 people who ran but did not get a prize. The results of the presidential elections and the lingering uncertainty in the results, including the court case that's been filed, has left many wounded, discouraged, and asking many difficult and hard questions, which it doesn't matter how we try, you really cannot get an answer that satisfies. And even here in our church, Sitan Woodley, People are asking questions. If we call a Macau or a Kamau to come and pray for the case on the Supreme Court, we think there are two gods that we are praying to. <laughs> this is the reality we face in the body of Christ in Kenya today. Many believed they heard clearly from God. And that was why they invested emotionally and financially in their preferred candidates and parties. Some may have quit their jobs because of the promise of a new Canaan when their candidate wins. I was recently reminded of somebody I know in Ghana. He was a vice chancellor of a top university. Two months to the elections in Ghana, he quit his job. The leaders of the region where he was pleaded with him to stay. No, but the ruling party had promised him a ministerial position, and he has to get ready for that. So he quit his job. Two months later, the results were announced. The opposition won, and he was left in the cold. Perhaps the same can be said of some of us in church today. Are you feeling like you have been left in the cold with the just concluded elections? You fasted and prayed even had night vigils. And thank God for August 8, because I think many of us have never prayed as we did over this period. 
And then the IEBC results came. And according to you, this was beyond comprehension. How can it be? I can't understand it. And you've been asking many questions since August 8th with very few answers. I work in an organization that is headquartered here in Nairobi. And about 90% of our staff members are Kenyans. I've been asked the same questions at work. And these questions are coming from very devout Christians, born again. And very God-fearing. So I don't take it lightly that they are asking. Some of the questions that I've heard asked is, does God really answer prayers? And if he does, why, is it look, why does it look like he answers it on one side and not on the other? Did I hear from God or was I being led by my emotions? Why is it that after nearly 60 years of independence, if you count another five years for Uhuru, that only two ethnic groups and three families out of the millions of families in Kenya and out of the more than 40 ethnic groups in Kenya have produced the top leader in the country. Are we all Kenyans or are some more Kenyans than others? Will there ever be a time when someone from outside the top five largest ethnic groups in Kenya can become president of this country like Obama did in the U.S.? How many Kenyan Americans do we have to vote for him to become president? As the questions go on and on without answers, so do the pains and the feelings of loss and disappointment. Are you in church this afternoon and you have been asking these same questions? Last week, Professor Bellon preached and told us not to worry that God, who takes care of the lilies and the ravens, will take care of us. But you may say, actually, I'm not just worried. I am in pain. I feel it. I am in anguish. I am in confusion, broken by the disappointment I feel with the outcome of the elections. I can't even find my feet or the grounds under my feet to begin to hope again. My brother, my sister, I wish I had the answers that could comfort you this afternoon. But I do have a message from God for you who has been hurting and for those who have been rejoicing over the past week or two. And that message is that you are running a race. We are all running a race. The race of the elections has come and gone. But our race is a lifelong race. Our race is continuing. God wants his people to learn from the elections and call to mind that we are running a race and that we must run to win. Many of the 16,259 contestants in the last election made very good efforts to win, but they did not win. At least, according to IEBC, they did not win. There were those who were predicted and projected to win, even by a landslide, but they still lost. Some were so close and so tight, but they still lost. I think of Lamu. The governorship race was won by less than 1,000 votes. The senatorial seat was won by only 58 votes. You can actually go to the street and get 58 people to vote for you. 
58 votes. In a race, we are told, many run. Many runners run, but only one gets the prize. How many of us actually thought after August 8th, there will be two presidents declared for the republic? Or that for Nairobi County, we will have two senators, uh, sorry, two governors. Is it possible? So we came, we went into this election knowing there will be only one winner for every single seat that was contested. Why did it appear to us like a strange thing happened and we can't understand it. In a race, all runners run, but only one gets the prize. That is the way the earthly races go. All run, but one gets the coveted prize. However, unlike the earthly races, and the elections where only one, only one runner wins the prize. There is a guaranteed prize for the Christian race. For the Christian race and for the person running the Christian race, there is a guaranteed prize. It is not changeable. Therefore, we have great motivation to run our Christian race and to run to win. Because there is a prize that is ahead of us. To win. To win the prize, however, there are three essential requirements that we must take to heart and always keep in mind. Three things that's required of us if we are going to run the Christian race. The first is that we must run the right race or the correct race. And we must run it according to rules. Every single race has its own rules, has its own guidelines, and you need to understand it. The guidelines for running a 100 meters dash is not the same as running a marathon. Every single race has its own rules, and we need to understand the rules. The second is that we must run to win. Some may be in a race as spectators, or as encouragers of other people. But if you're in need to win, then we must run to win. And the third is that we must finish the race. So let me look at the first thing about running the race, the right race. If you looked at the last election, there were many different races that people entered into. Some were MCAs, members of the county assembly. Some were women's rape. Some were members of parliament, ran for members of parliament, the seat. Others long ran for senatorial seats or governorship seats. And there were some that ran for the presidency. There is no single individual that was involved in more than one race. You couldn't be on two ballot papers. You would be disqualified. People entered specifically for one of these races. And the question really is, what race are you running today? In Philippians 3, from verse 17 to 19, Paul encouraged the Christians in Philippi to follow his examples. He told them with tears, as he said, that many Christians were living as enemies of the cross of Christ. That their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Paul was not talking about non-believers or non-Christians. He was writing to the Christians in Philippi. He was talking about those who were professing to be Christians. Their God is their stomach. Why have you been so discouraged and pained by the outcome of the elections? 
Does he have anything to do with your stomach? Hello? Is there, you know, somebody wrote a book here before about getting it's our time to chop. Is it, what is at stake here? Their glory is in their shame and their mind is set on earthly things. Does this describe us in the church today? Where is our mind set on? Is it on the race that God has called us to run? Or is it on the political kingdom that we wanted to get or we want to gain? In 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 3 to 5, Paul enjoins Timothy, he said, join, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ. Not one serving as a, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does, does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Jesus Christ is our commanding officer. And there are specific rules that's been set for the Christian race. Are you running the race according to those rules? Our Christian race starts with our faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we give our lives to him, as our Lord and personal Savior, that's the time the race begins. Everything else we've done, all the good work that we try to do, the churches that we attend, the prayer meetings, the fastings, the praying, everything else we do without Christ counts for nothing. It means somebody is running the wrong race. And you cannot expect to get the prize when you're not running the right race. I gave the example of somebody who decided to go to university and was never called by any university, but decided Nairobi University is the one I want to go to. Or maybe he was called by Kenyatta University. I said, I don't like to be on Tika Road. I'd rather be in town. And decided to go to Nairobi University. Did not register. Was not given admission, but started to go to, uh, for classes. Religiously, every single day, Monday to Friday, this person is in class. Sat for all the exams. Got straight A's in the exams. And four years later, stood on the line for graduation. Will he get a certificate? Why not? Because he's not a student. As far as the university is concerned, you are not a student. It doesn't matter how many A's you've gotten. You can liken the same thing to all our religiosity and activities that we do without Christ. The foundation of our faith is our belief in Jesus Christ. Unless you have been admitted and duly registered, all your A's account for nothing. If you've never given your life to Christ, today could be your opportunity to do that. And we'll give you that opportunity at the end of the day. And then you can begin to run in such a way to win the prize. Every single race has a starting point. For the elections, it was registering. Or maybe competing in the primaries or getting a thousand votes or however many votes to run as an independent. There is a starting point. And for a Christian race, it starts after we've given our lives to Christ. And Second Corinthians tells us that if you are in Christ, you're a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we must run the right race. And the right race, the right Christian race starts after we've given our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. But once you've started the race, we're also told to win the prize. You must run to win. The fact that we have entered the race does not mean will automatically win the prize. The Apostle Paul recognized this. And in 1 Corinthians, where we read, in verse 27, he said, No, I strike a blow to my body, 
and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. In Philippians 3, 13 to 14, he said, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what, forgetting what is behind and straining towards the, uh, what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In these passages of scripture, Paul gives us a glimpse of his mental attitude and the state of his mind as he prepares for his race that he was running. He ran to win. And because of the urge and the desire to win, he trained and he, uh, strenuously for the race. When you read phrases like straining forward, pressing on towards, striking a blow to my body, making it a slave, it paints a picture of the mental attitude and disposition of an athlete tra training to win the prize. Are you running a r the race endlessly? I learned that Muzungu means somebody who is running around endlessly. You jog in the morning and you see, where are you going? And nowhere, I'm just running. In my place, they say, a frog does not run in the afternoon without a course. When you see an African running, something must be pursuing him or he must be pursuing something. <laughs> and we are called to run a race with a purpose. Not endlessly. I watched a recent documentary, a movie of Usain Bolt as he trained and prepared for his races. He would train with some chains on his hands and legs and he would drag this weight with him to run with the weights as he trained. And by the time he finished, you look at his legs, there will be cuts and bruises all over. But the moment he steps onto the podium for the Olympics or the IWF, there are no weights anymore. He's done all the training he needed to do. He is there running to win. Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2, or Jesus to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and to run with patience the race that is set before us. Are you running the Christian race to win the prize? Even in our grieving and in our rejoicing over the outcome of the elections, are we conscious of the fact that we are still running a race? The clock does not stop for us to come back to our senses and then get back to our Christianity. We are running a race. This past week, I was discussing with a dear friend at work, and she confessed that in 2007, as she watched the news of some Kenyans being displaced in their homes and being chased away, somehow inside she was rejoicing. And it took years for God to bring into a point where she got so convicted about that, and she repented of it. She says, in 2017, I was not emotionally invested in the elections. I cast my vote and I trust God for the outcome. This should be the attitude of the Christian. This is not our kingdom. This is not the race we are called to run. We are called to run a heavenly race and we have to run it to win. Let me ask you, when you heard of the police raids in some parts of the city or some parts of the country, what were the reactions in your heart? When you heard of a six-month-old dying 
or an eight-year-old being shot dead, playing on their veranda? What were the reactions of your heart? It is in these unguarded moments that our true virtues and character are revealed. It's what happens in those moments that really show the strength of our faith. Whether we are running the most important race in life and whether we are running to win. The story is told of a race between a dog and a tortoise. We know what a tortoise is. Just picture it. A dog is running a race with a tortoise. At the sound of the whistle, the dog took off and ran and ran and ran. Five minutes later, the dog was panting. And when the dog looked back, he saw the tortoise still at the starting line. And the dog said to himself, why am I running so fast? Even if I have to walk the rest of the way, I will win this race, hands down. There's no competition. So the dog decided to get involved with other businesses. Took some time to play and some time to sleep. Three days later, the dog woke up, came back to the race, and looked back, could not see the tortoise. He felt, oh, he's still far behind. Maybe he hasn't even reached the first one kilometer of a 21-kilometer race. He went on to do his own things, had some more sleep, rested, played, did other things, and then came back again a day or so later. And as he came back, he looked behind. He couldn't see the tortoise again. Then he looked forward. And as he looked, he began to see the tortoise crossing the finish line. And the dog ran as fast as he could. But by the time he got there, the tortoise had won the race. Are you running with patience? The race that is set before you. What is distracting you today from your focus on the prize? One of the things I just came to understand and recognize is that racial and ethnic prejudice is one of the key distractions in our Christian race. Racial and ethnic prejudice is one of the key distractions in our Christian race. And one we rarely talk about in church. Paul was admonishing the Galatians. And he said to them, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has deceived you? In chapter 5, verse 7, Paul affirms that neither, 6 and 7, he says, neither circumcision no uncircumcision matters in Christ Jesus. Neither Luo nor Kikuyu, Kamba or Kalenjin or Luya matters in Christ. Neither Nasa nor Jubilee matters in Christ. No nationality matters in Christ. The only thing that matters and that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Then he adds, you are running a good race. Who has caught in on you? Who is hindering you? Who is interfering and preventing you? Who is causing you to take a detour on the race you are running? When we stop seeing each other as people that belong to the same body of Christ, that are washed by the same blood of Jesus Christ. And we begin to look at each other from the way the world and the society defines us. 
The Bible says our Christian race is taking a detour. God is calling us back to the track. My brother and my sister, we need to run to win the prize. It's only one body of Christ. It's not circumcision or non-circumcision. It's not Jew or Gentile. It does not matter to Christ. What matters to him is faith that is expressed through love. And that's what he's called us to. Anyone who is running to win keeps his eyes or her eyes fixed on the prize. They are not distracted by the happenings around them. You forget what is behind and you strain forward, pressing on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called you in Christ Jesus. We are called to keep our focus on Jesus Christ. Have you been distracted over the last two weeks? God is calling you to recognize again that the clock has not stopped. You are still running a race. And should the trumpet sound tonight and this afternoon, what will be your excuse? You are running a race and you need to run to win. We have an agenda to win the prize. And everybody that has that disciplines himself to that. The third requirement for winning the prize is the fact that we must finish the race. You must finish the race. In Paul's last missionary journey, he got to a place called Miletus. And from there, he sent for the elders of the church in Ephesus. And this is in Acts chapter 20. And from verse 22 to 25, he started to talk to these elders when they came to meet him in Ephesus. And he spoke to them. And there, he talked about a lot of things. And for some people, when you read through this scripture in Acts 20, sometimes your heart bleeds as you hear the, 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 the attention and the difficulties that Paul was in as he sought to finish his race. His eyes were set were set on going to Rome. And everywhere he passed, as he came to this place, there were prophecies that bonds and chains awaits Paul in, in Rome. Still, he was persuaded that that was where he was meant to be. And he knew it may be the end of his life. As you read this, even the people he was speaking to we are crying. As he tells them, I know you will not see my face anymore. I go here knowing only one thing, that there is bond and chains. But I am doing it because I want to finish my race. Paul was willing to endure whatever it is that lies ahead. Whatever the outcome of the Supreme Court ruling is, I want to finish my race. And I'm going to go through it because I want to finish my rest. And he wants to complete the work that God has given to him. He said he considered his life worth nothing. He knew that those who lose their lives will gain it if they lose it on account of the gospel of the kingdom. Though his life was worth nothing to him, it was worth everything to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was why Paul declared in Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He was ready to invest every breath he had to finish his race. And did Paul finish his race? Do we think Paul finished his race? If there's one person in the scriptures we can re refer to as somebody who actually finished his race, Paul was an example of such a person. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, from verse 6 to 8, 
As Paul's life was drawing near to a close, Paul boldly declared, For I am ready, I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only just to me, but to all who are longing for his appearing. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That was Paul's, one of his last words for somebody who had run with a purpose to win the prize. I finished the race. We can also look to Jesus as somebody else who knew the value of finishing his race. In John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The thing that he lived for is to do the will of God and to finish the work that God has given to him. And did Jesus finish the work that God gave him? We see in John 17, verse 4, Jesus said, I have brought glory, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So one thing we know that glorifies God is when we as believers finish our race. It glorifies God. So you're looking for how to glorify God. Run the race that he has set before you. Finish the race that he has given to you to run. You can remember Jesus on the cross of Calvary. As he gave breath his last, one of his very last words was, it is finished. He did it all. Even there, the one little thing that seemed to have remained for the scriptures to be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Just so that the scripture can be fulfilled, so he can ensure that everything that is written about him is being done. He said, I thirst. And that fulfilled the scriptures. And after that, he said, it is finished. The work the Lord gave me to do is finished. Where are you in the race that you are running? Have you taken a sabbatical because of the elections? Are you on a detour on the race? You know, in your own estimation, does it correspond to God's estimation of where you should be in the race that is giving you to run? We see somebody in the scriptures called Joshua. Joshua, by all standards, was an accomplished leader. History says he's one of the most military strategists that there is. Joshua led the children of Israel through River Jordan and had the strategy to get the walls of Jericho to fall down. Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land and divided the land to them. But what was God's assessment of Joshua in terms of finishing his race? We read in Joshua chapter 13, verse 1, it says, When Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, You are now very old, and there are still very large areas of land to be taken. You are now very old, and there are still very large areas of land to be taken. 
God is the ancient of days. And when he looks at a man and says, you are very old. <laughs> you have to consider it again. Are you waiting until God can look at you and say, you are now very old. And there's still many more lands to conquer. Maybe in your own estimation, you've done it. But is that what God has called you to? Lamentation 3.27 tells us that it is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Do not wait until you're very old to bear the yoke. It's not just for a man. It's for a woman, for a boy, for a girl. It is good to bear the yoke while you're young. Before God looks at you and says, you are now very old. And there's still a whole lot I have for you to do. As we go into prayers this afternoon, I want us to look to Jesus. We want to pray for three groups of people. The first will be those who have not even begun the race. Or you've been running, but you've not actually been enlisted in the body of Christ. You've never given your life to Christ. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. The foundation of our Christian faith is on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And today... If you are ready and willing to commit your life to him, he is able to deliver you and to give you inheritance and inheritance among God's people. That's the start of the race. That's the time you get in admitted and registered and you can get the results of all your labor and your work. Without that, you are running the wrong race and you've not started. Uh, we also want to pray for people who have already committed their lives to Christ, but they are distracted in the race by the events of the last few weeks or by anything else. Some of us rejoiced so much with the victories that people were beginning to wonder, isn't he a Christian? Some of us mourned and wept and are in so much pain that our Christian life has taken a detour and we really cannot see. You feel the Lord has failed you again. In Isaiah 53, we hear of Jesus Christ. The Bible says he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He understands pain. He knows it. And today we can come bringing all those pains and feelings of hurt and bringing them to the cross of Calvary for him to heal. There he carried our sorrows in his own body. He bore our pains. And the Bible says the chastisement that brought us peace were laid upon him. There is healing at the foot of the cross. And finally, I think we want to pray for those who feel they can't even see the price anymore. They come to church every Sunday, yes, but it's more like a routine thing. It's a ritual. It's like the pilgrim who is weary and tired. They don't even know if I can go one more mile in this race. I can't see where I'm going anymore. Jesus says, come to me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you weary in the journey? You really cannot look ahead and see the price of your high calling in Christ Jesus. Christianity is just a routine for me. God is calling us. Can we come back to him so that he can restore to us again the joy of our salvation. Merci.
Amen. Let's appreciate Dr. Eze again for sharing with us this afternoon. Congregation, I invite you to be upstanding. I fix my eyes on you. The perfecter of my faith. We will sing that song and take some moment to just go before the Lord. We have a couple of minutes before we reach the top of the hour. So we want to spend those few minutes remaining uh, in the presence of the Lord as we pray together. Amen. Release yourself before the Lord. I believe this sermon was a sermon of introspection. Where are you in your walk with the Lord? Have you enlisted? Or if you have enlisted, are you distracted by the many cares of the life around you and the world around you? Today is a call to come back to the Lord and refocus and have the right focus on the things that really are eternal, not the temporal transit things. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith. Amen. I fix my eyes on you, the author of my faith, casting aside every scene and every weight. I fix my eyes on you, Lord. I fix my eyes on you. I lay my burdens down. Of this world now fade away. I fix my eyes on you, Lord. I fix my eyes on you, the author of my faith. Casting aside every sin and every weight. I fix my eyes, Lord. afternoon we cry to you oh God realizing sometimes we get distracted oh God other things besides you do appeal to us Lord do captivate our imaginations oh Lord distract us from running with the zest and the zeal oh God of glory of following you oh God we seem to be delighting on other things oh Lord 
No wonder the disappointment sometimes, the emotional roller coaster, oh God. One time up, another time down, Lord. Discouraged and distraught, Lord. You challenged us, you've spoken to us to fix our eyes on you because your promises are sure. All your promises are yes and amen. You promise us a kingdom, oh Lord, that knows no end, oh Lord. Indeed, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, oh Lord. The political kingdom comes and goes, oh Lord. The empire only lasts for a season. But you also, Lord, is from everlasting to everlasting, Lord. We choose eternal things over temporal things, Lord. We fix our eyes on you who has called us, Lord, as your dearly beloved children, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, draw us closer to you, O oh God. Never let us go in the name of Jesus. Even in the midst of the political drama, we choose to fix our eyes on you, O oh God. O oh God, we surrender to you. We surrender to you, Lord, where we have placed our treasures. Oh, wrong places, Lord, we repent of it in Jesus' name. And we lay up treasures in heaven. We are moths, we are thieves, Lord. We are no political system can outmaneuver. We choose to place our treasures in you, O oh Lord. In eternal kingdom, in the name of Jesus Christ. We worship you, we honor you, we magnify your name. Lord, as we come to you, we know there are people hurting in this congregation, Lord. Perhaps the outcome has not been favorable. With the case before the court, it can still go either way or we have to vote again. We do not know the ultimate outcome. But regardless, Lord, our faith is in Christ Jesus. Our faith is in you. Our hope is in you. We choose to invest in your kingdom, Lord Jesus. We choose to look to you, O oh God, the rock of ages that cleft for us. We choose to hide ourselves in you. Have your way, Jesus. And as we continue that mood of prayer, I want to make a call has been already highlighted by our speaker. You're there, you're not born again. For you, you may be an also run, you're running whatever rest, whatever comes. The Lord is telling you. There's only one race on earth that really makes a difference at the end of the day. In this race, you can be a winner in Jesus' name. If you choose to look to Jesus, if you choose to enlist yourself in the kingdom of God, if you choose to run the race according to the rules, and if you choose to persevere to the very end, you'll be pronounced a winner in Jesus' name, and there'll be a crown in heaven awaiting you. You don't have to lose or give up. I want to make the first appeal to you to come over here. Let's pray together. You want to be born again. We have pastors, we have counselors already here at the altar to pray with you. Just come. Let's pray together. I thank God for your coming to church faithfully and regularly. That is commendable. Come again and come next Sunday and the Sundays to come. But guess what? Until you sign up, until you enlist in the kingdom of God, all your coming will count for nothing. You just be auditing things and you'll not be a candidate for heaven. You have to sign up. You have to make a commitment. For if anyone be in Christ, is a new creation. Behold, all things have gone away and everything is new. Have you signed up? Are you spectating? Are you cheering on the drama? Are you cheering on other competitors? Are you staying at the stands? The Lord is saying, come. I want you to sign up. I want you to be born again. It will be a tragedy to be coming to church and, and, and Sunday after Sunday and hear a powerful sermon and go back unborn again and you're not born again. At the end of the day, you'll be disqualified for the prize because you never signed up. What a tragedy. But today you have an opportunity to come. Just walk over here. Pick your stuff from your pool, your pews. Just walk over here. Let's pray together in Jesus' name. Is there anyone like that coming? Just raise up your hand if you want to be born again. You want to sign up for this rest. You want to receive Jesus Christ as your pastor, Lord and Savior, come here. Let's pray together. But secondly, those who are distracted 
and there are many distractions in life. It may be political. It may be other events around your life. It may be other things you have been paying attention to. And gradually you have gravitated from the Lord, from your focus on the Lord. And now you are thrilled and you are mesmerized by other things that have taken away your focus of the Lord. I want to pray with you as well. Or if your heart in perhaps events of the past week have left you wounded and, and hurting, although it's before the court, there's no guarantee that perhaps things will go your way. But after that, someone, it matters little who wins it because you still can be a winner in Jesus' name. It's not over for you. You can focus on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith. Just come over here. There's healing in the house. There's grace for you to minister healing to your broken heart, to your shattered world. In Jesus' name, the Lord wants to minister to you. He wants to encourage you. He does not condemn you. We do not judge you. God wants to minister to you. This service is here to bring you grace and courage to be able to rise up, shake off your dust, and lay off every weight that entangles you, whatever it is that has encompassed your life, that has hindered you from running as you should. The Lord is calling you to lay it down, come to the altar, lay down every emotional baggage, lay down every burden that you carry. The Lord wants to unburden you so that you can run the race set before you as you should in Jesus' name. Just come if you're discouraged. Perhaps you see no price. You see no sense in life. The life has played itself out in such a way that you're left confused. God wants to minister to you. God wants to touch you. My brother, my sister, come over here in Jesus' name. So as we sing the song again, I will not extend the appeal. I plead with you. Make your way to the altar. Let's pray together. The Lord wants to encourage you. The Lord wants to lift the burden you've carried, the discouragement, the fear of tomorrow, the fear even of the outcome of the Supreme Court and, or even your personal struggles. The Lord wants to minister to you. So come as we pray in Jesus' name. I'm exhausted. I need the Lord to touch me this afternoon. I need encouragement. Make your way here. Let's pray here at the altar in Jesus' name. The Lord is touching someone today. He wants to lift every burden, every discouragement, every weight. You've been carrying. God wants to minister to you. Surrender to him. He's yearning for you to say, I surrender to you. Just keep coming, that's it. Just keep coming. We are about to pray now. Just make your way to the altar. Let's pray together. Whether you're coming to be born again, to surrender your life to Jesus, or there's an issue that has been bugging your life, an issue that has been weighing you down, surrender it to the Lord in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.
to the sovereignty of God. Surrender to him who knows your details very well, who knows your address, who knows the emotional roller coaster that sometimes you go through. Surrender to him every pain, every doubt, every question, every anxiety, hallelujah, every dilemma of your life. Surrender to him in Jesus' name. Surrender every pain to him. Talk to Jesus, hallelujah. We surrender to you this afternoon, Lord. We worship you, we honor you, we magnify your holy name. We surrender, we surrender, we surrender. We surrender every pain. We surrender every confusion. We surrender, Lord, every anxiety, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We surrender to you. We surrender every emotional baggage, Lord. The things that have entangled us, Lord. The things that have slowed us down from running the race, oh God. In Jesus' name, this afternoon we choose to focus our eyes on you, to fix our eyes on you. You have called us, who is faithful, who will do it, who fulfill your good promises regarding our lives. We surrender to you, Lord. Today we reach out to your touch. Your touch, Lord. Where we are hurting, Lord. Where we are confused, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray your touch. We pray your touch. We pray your touch. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Balm of Gilead, bring healing, I pray. Bring healing to every heart, oh God, that is hurting today, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. this prayer after me, Lord Jesus. I come to you this afternoon. I thank you for loving me and dying for me at the cross of Calvary. Today, I repent my sins and I turn to you. Forgive me. Wash me with your precious blood and write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you, Lord for saving me. I am now yours and yours exclusively. Bless me and use me for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. The counselors behind you may want to talk to you briefly after the benediction. So don't be in a hurry to go. Amen. Even if you didn't come forward, you need to talk to a counselor to pray with you. Up close, you're welcome to come to the altar after the benediction. Amen. I say two Sundays ago, and I'll say it again, congregation, as your pastor, hold loosely to the political kingdom. Hold tightly instead to the eternal kingdom. 
The political kingdom is temporal. The kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ is eternal. While we may vote, we campaign, we do all those things and we need to do them, hold loosely to the political kingdom. The matter is before the court. The court may decide to uphold the elected president, the president-elect. It may nullify the elections and we go back to voting. But at the end of the day, there will be only one president in this republic. So a certain segment of us is going to suffer some setback. Are we going to be on this emotional roller coaster forever? Invest lightly in the political kingdom. Invest heavily in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't overinvest your emotions. You heard it from the preacher today. It's a sure way of being upset and being battered emotionally. I don't mean you don't participate. Do your citizen duty as a good citizen. Pray for those in authority. Campaign. Do whatever you need to do. Choose the right leaders for the nation. But remember, this kingdom is only here for a season. They reign for 10 years if they are lucky to survive a second term. But ultimately, they exceed the stage. But the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. If you invest in it, you will not be disappointed. You will not be disqualified for the prize. So let's pray for the outcome. Let's pray for impartiality of the Supreme Court. But at the end of the day, you and I need to reconcile ourselves with the truth that we're going to have only one president. You're not saying amen. I just want to prepare you for the coming weeks. We must at the end of the day accept the sovereignty of God. Having prayed and trusted God for leaders. At the end of the day, whatever the court decides, when all the drama is over, we'll have one president. And I pray that that will be the man God has appointed for the country. But that said, some people are going to feel cheated, going to feel disappointed. Let's not invest on this emotional roller coaster. Having said that, let's pray, let's come on Wednesday, let's pray that the will of God will be done. But allow me to spare your heartaches. Turn your eyes on Jesus. He promises faithful. He will never abandon you, will never leave you, nor forsake you. He has an agenda for you. All his promises are yes and amen concerning you. He will take care of you no matter the outcome. He will lead you, he will guide you, he will provide for you. He will supply all you need according to your, his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And I say to you again, it is well with you. It is well with Kenya in Jesus' name. As we leave the house of the Lord this afternoon, congregation, May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may he be gracious to you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May he grant you his peace, his abiding presence, and victory throughout this new week. God bless you. You're released. Have a victorious week. Amen. Amen.